Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where we are in the world. Um, thank you very much, um, everyone that showed up with this uh, new new world we're working through. A few technical difficulties trying to work through there. So um, we are uh, going to start through this slide and kind of do this in a, in a double step here. So um, again, thank everyone for coming. Uh, wanted to speak a little bit today on... Um, process control for plate making. A lot of times, uh, one of the things that, that I think we, we miss is the consistency that we can achieve today. And I want to go over how to achieve it, what to look for, um, and, and what we can miss. My name is David Chinnis, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, and uh, I uh, went to Clemson University uh, quite some time ago. I spent about 15 years in wide web film production. Um, in the range of applications, uh, was a plant manager for a trade shop producing corrugated and wide web film trade shop uh, uh, plates for a while. Um, and then I went into the photopolymer side of the business. I was a technical advisor, a technical manager for two global manufacturers of photopolymer plate materials. Spent about 11 years on the photopolymer side before coming to ESCO about nine years ago um, in support of the digital flexo market. I think the first thing we want to talk about and I want to define is the plates. Um, so on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about you know, when I mention a plate, what we're talking about. So the print surface, the face, the image area is the important part that we think about as far as making certain we have something to print. But we also have to concern ourselves with the shoulder, the shape of the shoulder, the size of the shoulder. In cer certain cases, the relief depth. Uh, corrugated different from thin plate, thin plate possibly different from um, thin plate labels, different maybe from wide web film. Uh, relief depth is important because that always changes where we're talking about floor thickness or the height from the printing surface to the floor. Today when I talk about relief depth, I'll talk about the height from the printing surface to the floor. Uh, obviously the floor measurement is the difference in the overall caliper thickness of the plate. All of these photopolymer plates today um, that we're making typically have a polyester back sheet that varies between five and seven mils. And, and that's an important um, consideration when we're deciding how to make these plates. So the first thing we'll do is talk about the process themselves, the digital plate making workflow. And I'm going to go step by step. The arrows along the bottom of this thing describe sort of each step we're going through and how we're going to do those steps and what we should look for in those steps. I can tell you that this has changed a lot from when I started when we made unsharp masks and tried to screen flexo plates in little tiny uh, bench top units uh, processed in perchloroethylene um, and hoped we could hold 85 lines um, per inch. So that's very different today. Our quality levels have improved drastically and we are producing um, in some cases, levels that rival gravure very easily. So the first step that we are going to take in the process and that we want to make sure that we define ultimately is the back exposure step. step. So in the next slide, we talk about the, that step. Back exposure is created by using a UV lamp, um, basically 365 nanometers. As we turn that lamp on, that floor, that cross-linking of of the polymers, the monomers, the photo initiators, they all get activated and that floor builds from where the light first touches it to somewhere in the middle of the plate. There's a zone sort of in the middle where some cross-linking happens, some doesn't. That becomes a little bit important at the end of the process, but we can have that discussion as, as we get there. So how do we control back exposure? How do we know what floor we need, um, what, what floor our customers need in this case? First thing to do is basically a back exposure test. How much UV light determines what that floor thickness is. From a very deep relief plate, lots of shoulder, um, maybe some unstable dots if it's too deep, to a very shallow relief uh, plate that in some cases, people may be able to print the floor depending on the substrate. One of the important things to note about back exposure testing is you should not only do it with each plate type you run, but potentially each batch you run. A lot of times in modern photopolymer plates, we have very quick back exposures listed in seconds. As a result of that, a very small one or two second change 
makes a huge change in the relief depth. So the back exposure test is very important is a very important step in what we need to do going forward. Um, in the next slide, we kind of go through how we set up that back exposure and how we would do that test. And basically, it's pretty simple. We're going to take a sheet of raw material. Um, we're going to create some lines across there. And I would suggest that you measure something out, put some times on there, uh, establish where you need to start, where you need to stop with a very good range from a very short time to a longer time. And basically, you're going to cover up each of those steps and expose that section of the plate for the full amount of time. So what's important here is that in the 12 second step, we expose for 12 seconds. In the 16 second step, we expose for 16 seconds. I don't wanna take 12 seconds and add four to make 16 because stopping and starting that reaction has different effects. ESCO has used that much to our advantage and we'll see it that at the end of this presentation. So on the next slide, basically as, as we click forward, you'll see me go from the, the 20 second step to the 24 second to the 28 seconds. The process control that's established here is, is very important and something that we have to measure to make certain that we're consistent on what we put on the plate. One of the most important things you can do when you build a house is make a proper foundation. One of the most important things you can do when you make a printing plate is ensure that it has a proper foundation. So proper back exposure. If we're out of spec, we may have trouble printing a plate. We may have inconsistent relief. We may have some dots in some areas that hold um, by happenstance and other dots in other areas that don't hold. We're printing inconsistently. We have inconsistent pressures on the plate. We end up printing something that, an, that a customer sends back to us or that we decide to reject. Uh, the other side of that could be that the reverses are filled in or are dirty and that issue becomes not being able to read small reverse type. Very important when you hit the tag and label industry or with today's ingredient statements with very, very small type. How does it go out of control? Probably the most, the, the easiest way for it to go out of control is for us to miss the back exposure time. If we set that back exposure at 18 seconds and we expose it for 21, that three seconds is a long amount of time. If we change batches and it's a very short amount of time, that back exposure could change drastically. Um, not warming bulbs up. Again, because this is a very short process, the bulbs being warm is very important to make sure we have a consistent output out of that light and the other and and again probably one of the most common ones is just a little just a few more hours out of that bulb we've only got 600 hours on there let's go to eight and the difference in six and eight hundred hours on a, a set of fluorescent tubes is great um, and you'll end up with a very large swing as you change energy on those bulbs again because we're using such short back exposure times very little change makes very drastic changes in the finished plate. The next step in the process ultimately is imaging and where ESCO becomes involved with this is, is probably key. We'll talk a little bit about imaging and how we control the process as we image these plates. Very important, we look at this as we look at the CDI Spark, one of the workhorses uh, been in this uh, business for quite some time and this is the first laser that I dealt with um, the sparks, the, the CDIs were introduced at Drupa in 1995. Um, hard to believe that we've gone from film to digital plates to where we are today in the process. So the spark is a very important part of the CDI is a very important part of that process. One of the first things our operators do when they're setting up the CDI and what I would encourage uh, our users to do on a routine basis is a focus search. The focus doesn't typically change. If the thickness of the plate changes drastically, we may see an issue. The depth of focus on the lasers is very good, but we actually run a series of lines where we change the focus on those lines, and we're looking for the very smallest line possible. Typically, that focus is gonna be in the middle of that series of lines. So if you look on the left, that, that focus search, that number you would key in on your CDI, is the middle number of that number of lines. On the right-hand side, you can see that very tight, very sharp line is shoved off to one side. So you 
basically limited your ability to focus that laser onto that plate surface. The next step we do, and, and what to, to kind of prove to you where this issue becomes, is an image of a plate surface. In this case, we've got a plate on the left where the focus is, is um, correct, an image on the right where the focus is incorrect. There's a couple things about that. Not only do you see a very small dot on the right, you also see some very ragged edges. So when I say ragged edges, there's some areas that are cleaned out, some areas that are not. It's a very soft edge, which does not make for a very good plate. The next step we do when we are checking the focus of the machine, controlling the process of the machine, basically is determining the mass uh, reaction to the laser. That is important because we go back one slide. I'm sorry, I, I, I got ahead of myself. So if you'll look at the left-hand side, you see the dots. On the right-hand side, you see those small fuzzy dots. Next slide is a finished plate to give you an example. What you see on that right-hand side is what we often call whiskers. And if you could imagine a pyramid, um, a round pyramid, if you will, um, and you've dug out both sides all the way to the tip, that's what those whiskers actually represent. So you've got a dot that's not supported on the top and bottom, and that's what that little line kind of shows is where that polymerization didn't happen because we didn't have control of that imaging. As we set up each plate, the masks have different what we call sensitivities, and so we'll look at doing a stain test. That basically is taking off a piece of the mask, reading the polymer itself, determining what that transmission is of the polymer, and then imaging a known value, reading those numbers of the known value, and taking those numbers back, adjusting them so that if we image this size dot, we get this number when we read on transmission densitometer, then we know we're producing a plate. Why is that's important? The mask on um, nearly every digital plate, the LAMS layer, the laser ablatable mask system layer, is a combination of polyamide resin and uh, carbon black and some other things to make it nice and flat. It's somewhere between two and three microns thick, but the amount of energy that it takes to burn the mask on different plate types could be different. It takes a different amount of energy to produce the same size dot. Does it make it better or worse? Simply makes it different. So checking the stain on each, on each plate type is extremely important. And I'm certain that your plate suppliers will concur with that. As we move forward in the process, the, the next step and the important step for all of us is to actually look at what image we're putting on the plate. Um, so we'll go through the imaging of, of the plate itself, um, what we're doing and what happens. On the, on the next slide, we'll see a main exposure. So in the main exposure, you'll see what, what's occurring here is using a vacuum. So this is the traditional old-fashioned old plate, if you will, on, on the left-hand side. We've got a vacuum pulled. We're exposing it with the same uh, UV system. 365 nanometers on average exposure. We expose through a piece of film, through a piece of diffuser film, and what you see on the left are, are those dots that are actually forming, and they're actually getting a little bit wider shoulders because what's happening is we're cross-linking polymer, and it's really hard to stop as it goes through all of those pieces of film, and so you get a little bit fatter shoulders, a little bit wider shoulders, and potentially a slightly larger dot than you intended. On the right-hand side, you're seeing a, a similar process, but it's the digital workflow. No vacuums, no films. The film is, in fact, the lambs layer on top of the plate itself. So they're being exposed in the presence of oxygen. Now, that's important because on the next slide, we see what happens on those shapes, if you will. Right-hand side, exposing through a piece of film, through a vacuum, you're seeing that, that shoulder actually get quite larger. So that dotted line in the middle of that dot, is what we imaged on the plate, what we see on the plate, what we'll likely print on the plate is much larger. On the right-hand side of the image, what you see is a much sharper dot. And if we'll click one more time, we can explain what happens is oxygen in the air basically interferes with the cross-linking of the polymers. That oxygen basically sharpens that dot and creates that bullet shape that we have today. There's lots of things we do to make sure that that bullet shape is the right height and the right size. And a lot of that in, in, um, is created by what we call a bump curve today. Um, 
we could go through that and spend lots of time on bump curves, but to make sure we have a dot that is the correct height to print is very important. In a traditional digital system, um, like we did in 1995, like we were doing up until recently, this is the way that the plates are ultimately formed. This is an image of the actual plate. So we've got an analog plate, one made with film, where we don't have, we're blocking out the oxygen. So we have not only the formation of the dot, we have a, a larger shoulder, a broader shoulder, um, maybe something more than what we intended to. On the right-hand side, the same size image, we've sharpened that dot. We now are trying to print with a bullet. So now we have a little small tip of the dot printing with the ever so slightest possible point. Um, very important to determine on your plates what your minimum consistent repeatable dot is. So we image a, a set of tonal values, and the reason why we go from 7, 8, 10% down to the very minimum dot, potentially a half a percent, is to determine what each plate will maintain at what relief depth. So we've established a relief depth. We know that we're going to hold X relief on each plate. So 20,000 relief, 18,000 relief on a 170067 plate. Now we've got to know what dot we can consistently hold on there. Same thing. We're going to image this tonal scale. We're going to expose it in increasing time, four, five, six, seven, eight. We want something that we know or believe will fail. We want something that we think is going to be way too much. In all practical senses, a digital plate exposed in the presence of oxygen is nearly impossible to overexpose. However, things happen to the surface of that polymer when you give it too much light that actually is negative. So in spite of, you know, eight and nine looking okay, 10 looking okay, we probably are going to go with nine as opposed to eight in this example so that we're not giving it too much light. Um, what do those dots look like on a plate where we're holding them and not holding them? On the next slide, we've got images of a plate basically where we've created this scale, different LPIs. On the left-hand side, same size dot, but you see a very inconsistent, very small dot, but it's very inconsistent. And if we widen that spread out a little bit more, you'd probably see even more dots that were laying over um, on the right-hand side, a consistent size, repeatable. So this is the dot we want to use as a minimum dot. One of the things that I would encourage you to do when you look at your dot fail tests is try to look at the dots in the center of those patches, especially if you've built a solid frame around the outside edges, um, because the, that frame around the out, outside edges can have a tendency to help support dots that might not normally be supported in a typical process image. So unstable dots, stable dots, very important to run that step test to determine what those dot, what dots hold, what dots don't hold. We're going to do this step test as we change plate types, as we change plate thickness, and even as we change plate batches to make certain that we're consistent. On the next slide, what we see is a, an effect of the same exposure, but a set of tubes that is fairly weak in today's uh, exposure um, outputs, energy outputs, versus one that is pretty consistent. So 16 milliwatts per centimeter square, a typical way that we measure lights. The light meters we use today, um, we can go from fairly inexpensive to four or 500 US dollars to four or 5,000 US dollars, depending on what that device does. So you can put a process control in for output of lamps fairly inexpensively. A $400 light meter is probably less than or equal to the cost of one blown plate if we miss because we've allowed our lights to get too weak. In the next slide, we'll talk about why we're controlling or what happens when, when this process goes out of control. Uh, the minimum dots don't form or hold. Small lines, small text doesn't hold. We get little wiggly lines because the shoulders haven't had enough energy to actually properly form and connect to the floor. Um, or if you're overexposing it, you've gone to the far end of that exposure, then you have brittle dots, chip dots. You've cross-linked that polymer to the point that it's very rigid and very little force causes that dot to break. What can we do? 
how does it go out of control? Um, we've picked the wrong exposure time. We, we've looked at the wrong number. Um, it, very important from an automated standpoint to make sure that we have correct plates in there, that we're making certain that this plate has this exposure time and their operators are, are paying close attention to that. If the bulbs need replacement, again, that $400 meter makes you um, very aware of how quickly those bulbs degrade. Um, I can tell you 10 years ago, we used to say 800 hours. Today, we say five or 600 hours. And part of that is because we are putting much finer dots on plates, printing at 175 at times 200 on flexible packaging on, on labels is much, much more common than it was just five years ago. And holding those dots is very important. Again, you go into the overexposure, too much light on a plate. You've got a, a plate that can be brittle, chips, uh, first rotation on a coarse stock, and you have a plate that has to be replaced. The cost of that plate, the cost of that light meter is more than covered in one hour of downtime on most presses. So as we go through this, the next process that we'll step is in fact processing. That is basically creating this finished plate, removing that polymer that has not been cross-linked. It's a really simple process and there are three basic steps in the next slide. We are three basic processes in the next slide. We talk about those. We're going to use something, solvent, heat, or water to remove that unexposed, uncross-linked polymer. Um, in the case of solvent, we typically use an, an alcohol and a hydrocarbon to wash away all that excess polymer. Um, that alcohol, that hydrocarbon may have a tendency to absorb into that plate. You'll notice on a washed out plate, if you overwash a solvent plate, it will have a tendency to curl downwards, curl towards the polyester base because that plate has absorbed quite a bit of solvent. On, um, you'll, you'll see the same thing in, in, a, in a thermal plate potentially if you put too much heat, or I guess the opposite, if you put too much heat on that plate, uh, it stays in the processor too long, you can actually distort that polyester. So making certain that that process is well done because we're applying heat and a wicking material to pull that waste polymer out through a number of rotations. Water, again, similar to solvent, uses detergent and water and brushes to scrub away that unexposed polymer. Most water plates don't absorb the water at the same level that they absorb the alcohols. Um, so you'll see some differences in those as well. But processing is very simple, but it's very important to make certain that your brush, brush pressure is adequate. You look at the small dots, are you holding them? Are you knocking them off? Are you scrubbing them off? Are you breaking them off? Could be too much brush pressure, could be an overexposure. Um, are you cleaning out the reverses well enough? Maybe you're not washing it long enough. Basically, the process control for doing a, a, a plate washout is to do a series of back exposures, one with no exposure at all, process that plate through whatever process you choose, make certain that your no exposure is below your minimum exposure, your minimum exposed thickness. So again, you're, you're measuring the relief of the plate to make sure that you're washing just enough below the surface but not too much that you're swelling the plate, causing damage to the, to the dots themselves. Processing process control, poor clean out of reverses, reliefs out of tolerance, over swelling of plate, uh, longer drying times, inconsistent plate pours. So the relief could be out of tolerance. If you're under washing a plate, you have raw polymer on the top, creates a whole nother problem on press. Um, if you're washing a plate too long, you'll get the proper relief, but you may be scrubbing dots off. Uh, if your solvent is unbalanced, again, from a solvent standpoint, we're using hydrocarbons and alcohols. Alcohols dissolve the mask, hydrocarbons dissolve the polymer. Too much alcohol, the polymer doesn't dissolve well. Too much hydrocarbon, the mask may not dissolve well. Uh, heat on a thermal unit, too much heat, we may distort that plate. They may not fit the same way. Um, maintenance, whether the brushes are worn, which is a very common occurrence, they, they actually do wear out. You're running with too much pressure, you're going to wear your brushes out more than normal. So those are some of the common things you'll look at process control from a standpoint of um, washing your plate and controlling that output. Your plate manufacturer will be more than happy to come in and go through the processing control on your process to make sure 
that they are optimized and ideal. To finish the plate, at least ready to go into the next step, we're going to dry it in most cases. So the only time we're not drying a plate, obviously, in the next slide, we, we briefly touch on that. And I talk solvent only. Now, again, I mentioned solvent as in hydrocarbons and alcohols, as well as water. So on a hydrocarbon plate, you typically are going to wash for or dry for somewhere between an hour to two hours, depending on thickness. Thicker plates have a tendency to absorb more solvent than thinner plates. Um, some plates, by their specific nature, don't absorb as much solvent. A plate with an optimized washes, washout time will typically dry faster than a plate that is washing too long. Um, solvent also includes water. You typically will dry a water wash plate to force the water off the surface of, of that plate to make certain that we are getting a good dry plate that it's not affecting the printing process. So pretty quick with solvent. The next thing that we really want to cover as we look in this is the process control. And they're varied and, and I have spent ages in um, plate rooms trying to determine what we believed was a drying issue where we had a dryer that was out of balance, that was actually not drawing away the vapors like it was built, allowing them to build in the box. So under drying, you'll have a plate that is typically thicker, and you may see that it's thicker in certain areas than others. So areas with a lot of surface area, which is a minimum dot because you've got the surface and all of those shoulders, lots of surface area versus some area with a large reverse, typically you may see a variance in caliper because that plate wasn't dried proper. When you go to put impressions on that plate in the press, now all of a sudden you've got dots printing that you're squeezing to get other areas to print. Um, drying in too much heat may cause that, that polyester to distort, to shrink, to change sizes a little bit. So making certain that your optimum from a drying time is important. What causes some of these items to go out of control? Wrong drying time. Insufficient exhaust. I mentioned that. You have too much solvent um, in that box, in that drying box, um, causing those not to evaporate as quickly, saturating the air. Heater's not working properly. Uh, most dryers today are balanced um, from the left to the right, to the front, to the back, to the center. So they try to make certain that they pull the air out as plate manufacturers determine as we got smaller and smaller and put more demands on plates, that that drying time is equally as important as any other part of this. So now that we've talked about kind of the plate processing from back exposure to face exposure to doing all the things we think are done, we do a final step. I alluded to this early on, but this is the light finish and detacking. Um, it's using the same 365 nanometer lights that we did the face exposure. And on the next slide, we kind of touch on, on what we're doing there. So the post exposure, the, U, the final UVC uh, or UVA exposure does the last bit of cross-linking, typically done with the same bulbs that are used to do the face exposure. Sometimes units have combination um, detac and post-exposed -expo post bulbs to help that process um, to become more efficient. But the UVA basically finishes any cross-linking, any polymer that maybe is not completely cross-linked. That's important because some of these polymers have affinities to the inks and solvents we use, and you'll see them be more um, receptive to holding ink in areas that we really don't want them to hold. Um, pretty quick, again, it's a finishing kind of process, so all we're doing is doing the final cross-linking, same as the main and back exposure. The other one, the light finishing, the UVC germicidal lamps. In today's world, we're hearing a lot about UVC germicidal lamps. Um, that actually removes the tackiness of the plate surface. Um, you figure that out with a step test. There's a couple ways to do that. You put the UVC in there. You give it a you give it a quick shot. Um, those UVC lights are actually creating ozone in that box. If you smell that ozone smell, that you might smell around treaters or after a lightning strike, you want to check your exhaust on your UVC exposure. But you can basically take that, hit it with UVC, and, and my rule of thumb was always flex the plate. When you flex the plate, you stretch that surface. That surface acts, and, and I say flex it, flex it towards the polyester, and then relax it. What you typically will see was a little bit of a matte, dull look initially, and very quickly that dull matte look should fade away. 
what that is is that face polymer actually stretching and then relaxing back well it's wrinkled a little bit when it relaxes but as that matte look goes away you've actually got a surface that is ideally post exposed if you stretch it you get a matte finish you relax you let it go and relax it and the matte finish stays you've taken that surface polymer and you've exposed it with so much uvc that you're actually wrinkling the surface of that plate going to be much more apt to crack um, again we'll touch on that on the next slide when we talk about the process being in or out of control so in the next slide to touch on what happens, too much exposure causing plate cracking or brittleness, too much UVA, again, or potentially detact time can cause brittleness and cracking. Um, a really sticky plate may actually cause ink to stick more than normal. Um, in the corrugated market, sometimes people use large unexposed plates or, or unexposed, exposed process plates with no detact time to actually pick paper fibers up off of a corrugated sheet. So it, they can be that tacky. As we go through the process, we've started with the back exposure. We've finished final exposure. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're now in the process of how did we get there? Where does ESCO come into this? So we'll talk, a, a, I, and I, again, jumped ahead of myself. So now that we've set through, gone through this process, we'll go through, we'll check the QC of the plate. We'll make sure it's dried down properly. We'll check the thicknesses on the floor, on the relief to make sure it meets the customer standard. The next step in the process, once we've realized that that plate is actually the correct thickness, it's dried properly, is we'll go to a process control tarp that, that we have put on each plate, and I would recommend this go on each plate. The example above there is an example of a, a process control target that can be used. You have set up the ideal process you've gone through you've um, identified your process steps you've dialed them in so that they're consistent they're repeatable now every plate that comes through is going to have this control strip on there and you're going to know that each time i make this plate this is the last block that will hold this is the first block that will hold whatever determination you make this is the what the line should look like and that way, your operators on a finished plate can quickly look at that sheet and make a determination that the likelihood that everything that I wanted to image on that plate is, in fact, on that plate. So process control, basically, these strips tell you that, yes, your process is in control. You have done the steps you needed to do. You have followed that, that standard to make certain that you lose no time on press due to a faulty plate. So now we'll step ahead and go in back to imagers um, and where ESCO comes into this. So today we have two basic imagers um, that, that we promote. And in this slide, you will see that we have the largest family of imagers in the world. ESCO has been producing digital uh, imaging devices with the CDI since Drupa in 1995 when it was introduced. We go from a very small 1712 A3 size up to a 50, 80, and any um, size in between. One of the most important things I can say about the process there is depending on your market segment, depending on what you're ultimately producing, work with your ESCO representatives to make certain that you right size your CDI. You don't go too small, that you're making too many shots, that you don't go too large, that you've got too much waste from a photopolymer. ESCO representatives will be more than happy to make sure that you right size that CDI to make certain that your process and your control of that process is correct. So one of the products, one of the main products you see today on the next slide is the CDI Spark. Um, it's a family that though you may have heard, we've introduced new imagers. The Spark is there. Um, uh, it's going to be there. It is uh, widely used across the world today more than 3,000 CDIs in daily operation. And up until a few years ago, uh, ESCO could proudly say that every CDI that was ever manufactured was still in production. Uh, the one that was, uh, that I always recall the story of that wasn't in production at one point in time was one that unfortunately got dropped off of a loading dock. Today, as we've moved through and updated CDIs and updated lasers and processes and controls and software within the system and screening elements. We've moved through um, from some of the older CDI uh, 
ESCO Barco units to today's Spark family. As we've moved through the Spark, as we've looked at what we need in today's market, um, ESCO introduced the Crystal product family. We, today we have the 4835, the 5080 uh, CDIs, in addition to an exposure unit. We'll talk about the exposure in a moment, but on the next slide, next couple of slides, a little bit about the Crystal. Crystal is a new design. Um, we're using uh, lasers in the similar, doing a laser ablatable mask. The difference in the CDI and the Spark is we've basically changed the height of the machine to give you more access. We've changed the automation of the machine. This machine will automatically load and unload plates up to uh, 635, 250, quarter of an inch thick. It's modular. It integrates with everything that we are producing today going forward. So automation engine can be automatically integrated um, with the CDI. It's much simpler from a standpoint of the user interface with touch screens, with uh, prompts that basically um, keep it as simple as we possibly can. So very important. Uh, if you've ever seen a, a, a crystal run, if you've ever seen a crystal operate, um, pretty impressive. I, I will admit a couple of years ago, the first one I saw, it was uh, not only does it perform well, it, it looks pretty uh, cool in a plate room as well. So with that crystal, um, as we talk about that on the next slide, to give you a little bit of ideas of, of what's there, and we'll go ahead and, and hit that button again. We've got a touch screen as opposed to the mouse. Um, pretty simple, very consistent. Um, the drum is very easy access. You're not reaching up to put large plates on the top or walking around the back of the machine. Very easy access. The lid uh, there will open up if you need to get into the drum. There is a foot pedal that you can use to actually open that up to advance the drum. On the smaller 4835, there's actually a light beam that does some of those same functions. If you're running a a CDI spark today and you've ever fished around the bottom trying to find that pedal, you know how important this wide format pedal and potentially that, that light uh, curtain for actuating that, that uh, door opening would be. Um, and again, working height, I, I can't say enough about that. I'm six foot tall myself, but having worked in plants where I had operators that were not quite as tall, sometimes that difficulty was, was pretty obvious. Um, as part of the CDI, as part of this imager, um, we've introduced the XPS exposure. So the XPS exposure is an LED exposure unit. It integrates with the CDI crystal. It actually is the same level. They butt side to side. Um, you're able to load and unload plates and basically slide the plate from the glass onto the exposure. Again, we use a similar touch screen that you've seen on the crystal. Uh, the exposures are preset. Um, our operators, our uh, technicians today are going through the volumes of plates from different manufacturers, trying to make certain that we have set an ideal back and face exposure to get fixed um, plate supply or recommended relief depths and minimum dots on these plates. So when you put this SPS exposure in place, you're able to go in and select a plate and select a relief depth punch that button, This the, the green box on the top is, is where the lights are um, actually, both back and face lights are in there. Multiple passes back and forth across the plate, not only forms a very consistent and incredibly consistent relief depth, but a very uniform and consistent surface. The quality out of the crystal, um, again, in my 11 years in the photopolymer side of the business, the quality out of the crystal exposure is something that I don't think I had ever seen before um, when, when I first saw this a couple of years ago. Uh, <clears throat> how it does it basically is a high intensity exposure lamp that starts the back exposure, utilizes the chemistry in the plate in a way that we haven't been able to do in the past. So it utilizes the polymers, the monomers, the photo initiators, and the oxygen dissolved in that plate to create an ideal floor, to create ideal shoulders, and not too much, not too little, but very consistent. That simultaneous face and back exposure utilize the chemistry in a way that has never before been possible. The kind of close on that, uh, the, the XPS crystal, um, it's, it's very simple. In the next slide, we show again the image where we've got a 
a very uh, a very simple graphic user graphical user interface. You see the head in this case moving. It's a simple touch to touch screen, predefined settings that we have actually created for you, where we are testing the plates. We're going through the process. A lot of the steps that you may have to do in your own facility today, we've gone through to set the back and face exposure on this plate for the ideal. Now, your ability to manipulate slightly a relief depth is certainly there by keying in the numbers, but the software is written to make those adjustments to the face and back exposure to um, create that consistent plate. So the next item that that um, I, I got kind of a, a last uh, last minute request, if we will, and and one that's uh, very near and dear to my heart is a little bit of an extra item here. It's called Digital Flexo Suite, and for me, it's really the last element of a quality plate going out into the press room. As a former press room supervisor, a press room manager, a mounting and pre press supervisor, I understood the interaction, the interplay between a well mounted plate and how well they ran on press. A poorly mounted plate that lifted constantly was not a good thing to happen based on the cost of press time. So what I wanna do here is kind of a quick overview. We're gonna, we're gonna run a, a brief movie here. Um, and I think that um, Frederick is gonna pull this. This is actually a, a YouTube just to make sure we get good process. I'll try to speak over this a little bit um, and try to rush you through it about two minutes in this movie. Um, Digital Flexo Suite gives us the opportunity to very precisely cut Flexo plates. Don't think much about it. We're cutting them out today. We've got our plate makers cutting these plates out. They're sending them out to the press room. They're then being sent to the mounters. And then oftentimes those mounters are cutting those plates a second time. So now we've cut the plates twice. For them to be able to cut those plates a second time, we're also creating waste in the material that we don't have to create. As we watch the video, not only can we do this for thin plates, but we can go into the thick plate to the corrugated market. We can add bevels to these corrugated plates. We can create the carriers for these corrugated plates. But even more so, when we look at a full integrated system where Automation Engine is sending some of the cutting data into the table, we're able to group plates together automatically through Automation Engine, through other software that we've produced that allows us to automate this process to almost a hands-off. In this case, we often take foam to place between plates to make sure that it's they're safe, they're stored well. Um, we can do that very simply using the same files we make to cut plates. We can plot that carrier, as I mentioned, for corrugated to make certain that we have a consistent plate that's in register and we're not depending on someone's using the, the ruler or the straight edge. Um, it's much safer. We're not using uh, utility knives and such to cut this or straight edges potentially causing cuts in our plate room, losing precious downtime from our customers or from our, our um, operators. One of the last things and what I thought was very the, the most impressive part of this, having been a, a plate room supervisor and in charge of maintaining these plates, is this element of the new Kongsberg 8X system and QuickBox. The ability to quickly stack up a set of plates with our foam, to take those measurements, to key those measurements in the software, put a piece of corrugated down on this table to go through and create a box that we can then store our plates on a shelf with a custom box, or we can ship our plates to our customers using this custom box. Uh, to me, probably one of the most exciting pieces that I am admittedly a biggest Flexo geek you've met, but creating that box probably uh, was one of the most exciting things I saw from the standpoint of Kongsberg. So where we are today, um, we've gone through hopefully a little bit of process control, giving you an idea of what's important um, giving you the idea of where ESCO fits into this with our software, with our hardware, not only to create, um, to image the plates, to, but to create the art on the plates and finally to cut those plates ready for press or ready for storage. So in this case, if there's anyone that has any questions, um, I, I, I am more than happy. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Again, I apologize for starting a little bit late, but um, I've got about 10 minutes to ask 
answer some questions here. Let's see uh, how we start this. Um, let's see. I'm gonna go David, I'll, I'll help you sure. through the questions. Okay. This, hi, everyone. This is Rory Marsoon, uh, Director of Business Development for Flexo. Uh, I'm also the guy who's been trying to flip the, the slides the right <laughs> way. So <laughs> you might be wondering what, what was wrong with David. It was actually my fault. So, uh, but we do have a good number of questions here. So, um, and some really good questions. So I'll, I'll start feeding those to David and, and, uh, certainly David, if, if, um, okay. if, I, if I can help anyway, I'll, I'll do that as well. So, and, and, and I, a couple of them here, I'm going to probably go backwards based on they come in, but very, very interesting question. Um, Igor, and, and I'll try to keep him in order. Igor asked why we came back from digital round top to flat top dot. What is the main reason for this? Um, that, that's a, probably a, a loaded question as I go through this. Um, again, spending 15 years in manufacturing, um, we all have different opinions of, of how this came about, why it came about. Um, a lot of it, I think, has to do with um, folks looking at dots on film or dots on paper as opposed to looking at an image. Um, I'm the guy that looks at an image and says, I'm selling you this image. I'm selling you this color package, the diapers or chips or whatever the case may be. And you want to look at that with a microscope and say, hey, this dot has a hole in the middle of it. So that round top dot had a tendency as you put more impression of on that dot, that center of that dot, put more impression on the substrate, squeeze the, the ink out to the edges. Um, the control of the impression caused some variations in highlights. So that flat top dot, because of the, the, the physics of the way that dot impresses, it actually doesn't distort. You've got a flat, confined circle that as you compress it, compresses a little bit differently than that round top bullet. The bullet gets a little bit wider. So um, yes, the webinar will be available, recorded. Um, I'm sure Frederick's going to handle that for us. I hope I answered the uh the question about the flat top round top a little bit. Rory, have you got anything? To I just add want to that? add one one comment to that. And that is, you know, one of the big um, new technologies that we see out there is uh, the use of, of uh, surface screening on your solids. So in ESCO language, we'll call that microcell. Uh, there's other technologies out there. Microcells, the, the really fine, uh, high frequency patterns, um, will not really uh, translate into a good pattern if we use a round top exposure. We need a, a more flat top uh, exposure in order to kind of hold all that fine detail in the surface of the plate. So it wasn't until we started going back to flat top that those microcell patterns become, be, finally became more effective. R Rory, um, just to add to that very quickly, if you remember me recalling, I, I mentioned that oxygen actually affects the surface, uh, affects the shape of the dot. Think about that. It can't define the surface of the plate or the shape of the dot. So when you expose in the presence of oxygen, you also slightly lose some of the thickness. So that's where you lose some of that fine microscope screening that's on the plate because you're also losing slight, slight amounts, almost immeasurable with typical measuring devices that we would use calipers and things like that in the shop. Um, uh, yep. Manuals or books, I would certainly recommend the FTA's books on um, the, the, the uh, and I'm blanking out, Rory, it's, uh, I apologize. It's called, it's called the, FIRST. The FIRST, FIRST system for looking at, um, at that process control. And I'd encourage you to go to your plate manufacturers, your, your plate suppliers, and have them go through and help you establish a system of process control very simple, very straightforward in front of all your operators. Um, the, um, I'll also add, the, so depending on where you live, and there's people from all over the world on this webinar, um, you know, there's different organizations. Uh, in, the, in the U.S. and North America, uh, we have the FTA, and that, that's really who developed FIRST. Um, that in first has been translated into Spanish and, and we're seeing it in, uh, in some of the Latin American countries and so on. Um, in Europe, there's also an organization. It's kind of like, I think it's a European FTA. I'm not sure the exact name at this point. Um, they just recently came out with uh, a toolbox, which also dives into some of these things. So, uh, in, in any case, I think it's, um, a good idea to just reach out to your, your local, uh, trade organization, your flexographic trade organization. 
So let's see. Uh, I'm going to go down a little bit so I don't lose, and we'll go back to the top. Um, Larry, I, I, Larry, I'll be happy to discuss that with you real quickly. The crystal uses multiple passes because it's the the, the it's it's utilizing the chemistry in the best way. So without getting too deep into it here, we're actually utilizing the chemistry ideally. So we're doing multiple passes, allowing some of this chemistry to relax between the passes. And we found that that gives us a very consistent, very repeatable dot that's not growing like we've seen some of the other dots, but we're getting a lot of, if you imagine the a polymerization process happening and the dot on the top of the plate kind of looking like a teardrop as it forms, as that drop of water gets a little bit, or drop teardrop gets a little bit bigger, where the bottom point touches the plate is where it's formed first, where, where it actually attaches. And to create that so that you're actually creating a shoulder that's steep, um, but yet not broad is very important in the process. And to sort of answer another question, it's the reason why we've been able to actually keep dots that hold up on plate that don't fall over. We're utilizing chemistry, um, we're utilizing the effects of oxygen, but we're controlling it very, very precisely over a film process. It's an analog. If you put film on top of a plate and expose it, it is an analog process. You are blocking um, any additional oxygen from coming in the plate. If you pull a vacuum, you're pulling some of the oxygen that's already in that plate. Uh, important to note, dissolved oxygen exists in a plate. So I'm going to go all the way to the bottom here. How do we avoid cupping effects on dot? Good question. Cupping is very important to look at. Uh, cupping can be typically what you see with cupping. Um, it, it can be polymer related, but typically it is an exposure issue. So fine tuning that exposure to make certain that you're not overexposing. What happens is we cross link the edges because they're available. So they start cross linking in that polymer. And as it gets harder on the outside, more cross linking occurring, that dot kind of forms up. The, the polymer in the center doesn't seem to cross link as quickly. It's surrounded by other cross link polymer. And so you can form a cup. So that ultimately, I would tell you, I would look at my exposures first if I had cupping on a plate. Typically really bad with corrugated plates, uh, older corrugated plates. Some of it is plate chemistry. We've done some things that have, um, uh, they've done some things from the standpoint of plate chemistry to try to help some of that. Looking for a light meter, what exactly am I looking for? Um, if a basic light meter, you're looking for a light meter that will read in the range of 365 nanometers plus or minus. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry, you're looking for an energy in, in this case. So, um, the, Roy, I, guess, I mean- the, quite, the manufacturer we typically okay. use, and, and I think most of our um, plate supplier partners are using is called uh, Kunast. Kunast, And yeah. that's spelled K-H-U-N-A-S-T. Um, you want to you want to get one that's got a probe on it, so it's like a, a little disc on a on a with a wire attached to it that plugs into the UV meter. Um, you know, you can also buy ones that are little that look like a little hockey puck. Um, those typically give you more of like a, a cumul accumulated measurement, so it's it's kind of speaking a little bit of a different language. Um, but if you want to align with ESCO and with the plate suppliers, go with the Kunas meter. Make sure you get a meter that measures UVA, UVA. because they do also make ones that measure UVC. Um, and and if you have trouble finding one of those, reach out to us and we'll we'll be sure to hook you up with uh, a, a supplier. You'll also typically see a variation in price between a UVA meter and a UVC meter. UVC meters are typically much more expensive. One of the things as well as when you're measuring that light under the exposure frame is I would recommend that you kind of divide your exposure frame into quadrants, depending on the size. So, you know, a 48, 35, you can probably divide into 12 sections, a 25, 30, maybe nine sections. So as they get larger and kind of chart the exposure in those sections to see if it's consistent, especially if you're using uh, a fluorescent tube unit, because you may see that certain edges are the, the, the bulbs are wearing out closer to the edges or closer to the ballast or you may have a ballast that's hot that basically is causing some issues there. Um, important key points, parameters that need to be performed for having a right, a minimum dot. Um, really for me, the, 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 the key point is to uh, number one, set your, it's kind of hard because there, it's a cumulative effect, but set your exposures set your relief depth and run that relief depth. 
if you run a 20 millimeter relief depth, don't accept a 25 plate, don't accept a 15 plate. If you're going to run a 20, if it's 21 or 19, I'm okay. Um, again, somewhat depending on photopolymer, set that relief depth, stick to it. Don't accept a plate that's outside of whatever you, the specs you decide. And you really need to make certain that those specs are realistic and they give you a consistent result. So a 25 may not hold what an 18 holds. So where it starts failing, come within that step. Um, then you do the same thing with the face exposures. Make certain that you're not picking a dot on the plate that is not consistent. So if you run this test, and, and I would tell you, run routine tests. Test monthly to begin with. If your process is in control for six months and you test it every month, then test it every two months. And then if it stays in control after a year, but it's important to put the process in control simply to check your process. If you're not doing that, if you're not checking the control of your process, you really are just guessing. So hopefully that, that gives you an answer there. Um, crystal, the Crystal XPS and competitive um, solutions with LED. Rory, you want to try to touch that one? Sure, yeah. Um, well, you know, LED exposure has been around for a while. Um, ESCO has been selling LED exposure solutions for a, around 10 years or so. Um, originally, the first versions really were not doing back exposure. So the XPS was the first, the first solution that had back exposure. Um, and th there are a few other solutions where um, it's a combination of LED and standard bank light exposure. Of course, the XPS is 100% LED, which, you know, LED is, is going to be the most consistent and the highest quality type of exposure. So it wasn't really understood, I think, the benefits of doing back exposure with LED until the XPS came onto the scene. Um, there's, there's at least one new player that's out there that's so new in the marketplace that we don't know much about. You know, we really won't talk much about at this point. Um, I can tell you that ESCO has uh, a tremendous wealth of knowledge in LED exposure, and I can tell you we have made a lot of bad plates over the years, and we've learned a lot of things, and um, exposing with LED is not a simple thing. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're definitely um, out there ahead of the others in terms of just overall knowledge of LED exposure. Just, just to touch on that, I guess, Rory, as well, from my experience, again, I spent 11 years on the photopolymer side of the business from the technical side. Um, I, I, I don't mind to tell you that when I was in that side of the business and we talked about similar things and being able to do this or do that, and a lot of it was the ability to control the light very precisely. And I had incredible polymer chemists say, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Their reaction was more a response to where we were in the world with the, our ability to control the light. Um, again, my experience from 11 years there to nine years here and seeing that uh, XPS exposed the first time, my jaw dropped. Um, it was very, you know, it was kind of like, wait, these guys were telling me, they weren't telling me the truth, but it really related to where we were and our ability to control that. Uh, John Monforti asked, does a crystal CDI and XPS support a 250 plate thickness? It does support a 250 plate thickness. Let me just add one thing there. The, so it, there's, there's no limitations on thickness for either of those devices with the exception of the automatic loading and unloading on the CDI crystal. We are only supporting up to a 155 plate with that automation just due to the, the, the weight and the, the size of those plates. Um, so up to a 155 thickness. On the XPS, um, there's no reason why we couldn't expose a 250 plate. At this point, though, we we are limited in the, the number of thick plates that are certified for exposure. So David didn't really talk a lot about the certification process. We have a whole other webinar that we did on the XPS, so I'd encourage you to, to, to um, watch that webinar. But... Uh, we have, you know, we go through a process where we have to determine exactly the right exposure parameters um, on the XPS. And, you know, obviously there's hundreds and hundreds of plates on, in the market. So we have to be very selective and prioritize which plates we certify first 
and uh, you know what's where where are the priorities? And we simply have not gotten a lot of requests for the thicker plates at this point. So th in the future, I'm sure every plate will be certified. But today, we have a very limited number of thick plates that are certified for the XPS. Where the next question I see on here, and, and you, I'm sure you want to touch on this too. I, I think I can answer this fairly well. How does the Steve Penny ask how the throughput of this crystal imager compares to the latest CDI Spark imager? We're still the optics numbers. So an optics 80 uh, is an optics 80 on the crystal as well as it is on the Spark. One of the advantages, especially with the auto loading and unloading of the Spark, is the operator doesn't have to do that. So the operator's availability to do some other action. It may be putting the plate on the on the Kongsberg table to cut out those plates. It may be boxing those plates up. So the the speed is an optics eighty is an optics eighty, um, but but the operators the automation part of it allows that operator to you to do other things during that process. You want to touch on anything else there, Rory? No, that's exactly the right answer. Um, we, and just on that topic, we did just recently release a technology called Optics 100, which is uh, allowing us to go to uh, 10 square meters per hour um, at, at uh, standard resolution. That is available on both Spark and Crystal. So at this point, there's no, different, no difference in, in terms of throughput between those devices. Um. Here's here's one that I I, I I sort I may have addressed this a little bit. Um, Ferrando Herrera, do you have a test? <coughs> excuse me. Do you have a test of how much a highlight um, with crystal screen two percent will last compared to a normal circular dot? We found competitive plates fall down. Um, a lot of that has to do with the strength of the shoulder. So if you're not put if you're putting a dot below uh, a consistent size or you get a very tall, skinny, no shoulder dot. Um, it, it's all about the foundation. Um, and we put a good foundation on our minimum dots. That's one of the reasons why we go through the process of certifying the plates, um, certifying, in effect, we're certifying the chemistry of the plate that the reaction with the UV light and what we do is going to produce a high quality, consistent plate. So it, it, I, I don't know if there's another way to answer that one, Rory. Well, and he's asking specifically about crystal screens. Um, again, there was a web there's a webinar on that as well. If you guys are interested, um, so so what we do find with crystal screens specifically is that you can print with less impression, um, just due to the the patterning on the plates and and the the way it transfers ink and so on. Uh, which will lead to a longer plate life. And, and in addition to that, we have found that the XPS, if you add that into the equation, often does result in longer plate life. Um, but that's a, it's a tough question because there's so many factors that come into this, right? I mean, which photopolymer plate are you talking about? What substrate are you printing on? What ink system? You know, is the operator uh, printing with minimal impression? There's a lot of factors that can come into play. But you know, if with all else equal, um, I would have to say that, you know, we have seen a, a, a little bit longer plate life. There hasn't been a formal study or formal test done um, to prove that or to quantify that. The next one, and I'm the question, uh, Gabriela Romero, uh, electronic more from the CDI only improves if the plate is um, copied in partial decreasing speed root cause. I, I'm, I'm a, not really sure if I understand that question. Um, I'm guessing though, uh, automatic beam selection, ultimately it's a, it's a matter of, of mathematics. When you start screening a plate and you've got a, an array of lasers imaging that plate and you also add an angle to those dots that you're producing, the more A is typically created because the, the mathematic formula of of pixel dots versus uh, uh, line screen dots versus screen angles all meet to form this perfect storm. Our automatic beam selection actually does that by selecting the, the a, a set of beams that minimizes or eliminates that, that moray pattern in the plates. Um, so if you're using less beams, the way that the energy is dispersed differently, but I, that's, I'm, I'm not certain that the, the partial Decreasing speed, if I understand that correctly, Rory, I'm not, 
I probably didn't answer that very well, but yeah. Well, I mean, and I think that's part of it. I, you know, talking about Moray on a, on an imager um, could be caused by many things. Uh, if it's decrease, if the Moray decreases with speed, um, I might guess that there's something to do with a microcell pattern. Microcell patterns tend to to image uh, a little more accurately when we slow down the drum on the CDI, uh, which is why, you know, that's kind of one of the, ba one of the foundations of, of p the, you know, Pixel Plus technology is that we, with that technology, we slow down the drum so that we can more accurately image that high frequency pattern. Um, but without really knowing more about, you know, the specifics, it's hard to give a, a, a more detailed answer on that. So if you, if you want to reach out to us um, directly, we're, we'll be happy to look at that. Let's see, uh, mention the dry process, um, lava or fast against solvent for crystal screenings. Um, they do no good while washing out as they are so small. Uh, you know, I would go back to your plate supplier and, and look and make sure, uh, th this goes into the process control, um, Fernando, to make certain that you actually have the correct uh, surface screening on that plate that actually, it, it's not just can an image in the mask, it's can the process actually also hold that. So it's all, it's all combined. It's not, uh, it, none of it stand alone. So that's what I would suggest that as you look at the process for the thermal plates uh, and make certain that you're holding the minimum dot, uh, e even in the, in the surface screening, that the process will hold. Because it could be the process, you know, that plate doesn't hold something as fine as you think you need, but it may hold enough to, to create the, the plate that you, you have to have or, or the plate that's possible. Um, questions are for film printing, um, solvent inks. Uh, so I'm talking about the spot inside of the dot are very small. We're told to hold a one pixel dot. Um, you want to try that one, Rory? I, I, I'm talking about uh, Fernando Herrera. I'm talking about the spot inside of the dot are very small. We're, we're, we are to hold a one pixel dot, not very well formed, but the image was there in pixel plus. Mm. I, I, that sounds to me, like, that's not, it's a process issue. Well, and, and yeah, it's not, ex I apologize. It's not, it's not clear to me what the, what the question is. Um, so Fernando, uh, you, you and I know each other, so <laughs> I'm happy to have that conversation with you offline. The last so question, it's about a little, a little, more. little bit long here. The last question in here um, that I've got, I think, um, is uh, what is the max, re max resolution we can have in plate exposure? Um, well, it, it's process dependent. It, it depends on the output. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking resolution as in screen resolution, not in imaging resolution. In imaging resolution, um, ESCO goes typically between 2400 and now uh, 5080. Um, so which is 2540 is our typical process. Um, get into the 2.54 and, and millimeters and inches and all those good things there. But 2540 is, and 5080 is, is double the 2540. Uh, specifically, if you're talking about resolutions and plates, that really is, is plate and process controlled. Um, some plates have a much higher, the, the, their ability to resolve is much greater than other plates. If you're trying to put a 175 line dot, on a 635 plate, um, I would suggest good luck. Um, an 85 line on a one on a on a 635 or 250 plate is is certainly possible. Um, 030 plates, 045 um, have a tendency to hold dots, and a, a lot of it has to do with the ability to have a a strong firm foundation. So a 045 plate at 175, 200. Um, real honest LPI resolutions, no, no smoke and mirrors there, should be able to be done on certain photopolymer plates, maybe not all of them. Um, quality of polymer has a, has a big deal to do with that. Uh, some polymers are better than others. Some polymers cost more than others. And, and a result of the quality, the, the technology, the, the raw material that goes in those products is certainly related to um, what you can put on a plate 
but also the processor or, or your, do you have good brushes? Do you have good light output? All of those things are part of that process. Identifying those steps, controlling that process of wherever you are today and saying, this is what I can do day in and day out, but I need to improve it. How do I need to improve it? It may be that my lights are weak. It may be that my brushes haven't been changed. That's the important part. I think that I would tell you as a former photopolymer guy, um, I would go through the process. We would, we would identify the washout to make certain that it was correct. We would go through every step of the process. Obviously, imaging is important, but a perfect image on a plate that's processed too long or exposed too long or too short will never produce a good plate. You have to control each step of the process. And there are easily controllable or at least measurable. If back in my old school days, um, my professor used to say, if you can measure it, you can control it. And, and I am a firm believer, if you can measure it, you can control it. So I would encourage each of you guys to met, start measuring today. Uh, the tools are fairly inexpensive in the big scheme of things when you start looking at the cost of photopolymer. So uh, good plate making. Anything I can um, help you with in the future, um, please reach out and I'll be happy to help. There's, there's one more, um, more of a comment here from somebody. It sounds like kind of a warning. Uh, stating that Kunas has been counterfeited by a Chinese company. So I guess when you go to buy oh, yeah. a UV meter uh, that we like we discussed earlier, um, make sure you're getting getting uh, you know a legitimate UV meter from the Rory, manufacturer. Rory, let me uh, let me throw another thing out to you. And talking about process control and Kunas meters, something that I learned the hard way in my photopolymer days. If you buy a Kunas meter, it takes a small nine volt battery. And what is very odd about the meter, and I'm sure there's an electrical reason for that, but if you put that nine volt battery in there and you leave it in there for 12 months, what you will find is a unit that is measuring 20 uh, milliwatts per centimeter square. At the end of 12 or 14 months with your routine use of that light meter, it may all of a sudden read 25. And what you, so what happens is just the opposite. If you see the energy levels increasing over time on a unit, on a on a on a exposure unit as opposed to decreasing, the first thing to do is change the battery because a weaker battery provides false readings, but they're false high readings versus false low readings. Don't immediately go and recalibrate that Kunas meter. I'm speaking from experience. Change the battery. So I would put a process in place to every six months or however often you use that meter to check with a new battery to make certain that you're getting the a correct output. Also, just add since since uh, we're on that topic, um, <clears throat> those meters are not perfectly accurate. Like they're they're good enough to give you uh, a, 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 an approximation of where you stand, um, and also they tell you where you are in in relative terms. So you know this side is weaker than the other side, but um, you know these devices. You know, if it's not calibrated, uh, you know, to match some kind of standard, then the numbers can't be used uh, as kind of a, you know, a, a black and white, if you see what I'm saying. So just be careful about that. Um, they're definitely good for, for monitoring your process and how it goes up and down and, and how it uh, changes over time. Uh Folks, I appreciate your um, participation today. I, I um, still got 86 people holding on. This, this presentation will be made available. Um, if you're registered, um, I think Frederick or somebody will send out um, the uh, recordings of this. Uh, again, reach out to me if I can answer any questions in the future. I'm happy to. I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't mind to admit I'm a Flexo geek. I, I love the process. Thank you very much for your time.